As you all know, my name is Kwaja Shams. I work as a, I wear several hats at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and one of my roles is a mission cloud expert. Um, I work as a software engineer on the mission site, and I work very closely with our Office of CIO, um, specifically Tom Soderstrom, to bring the benefits of cloud computing to our missions. And Tom and I go and talk to a lot of our missions across NASA about what cloud computing can actually do for them. And in our adventures, we have come across uh, a lot of these, uh, some prevalent myths that have, uh, that are very popular for people who are considering using cloud computing. And today I'm going to share three of these myths with you and kind of share some of our insights on them. So let's start with a little bit of a background. The NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory is the premier NASA center for unmanned exploration of space. We have robots that fly, robots that walk, robots that drive, robots that swim, robots that do all of the above on any other planet needed that you can think of. And part of what's, being, uh, what's so great about being a JPL is that this is what you get to do. This is what our core set of expertise is at. And we kind of want to be able to focus on these set of uh, expertise. A uh, little known fact about JPL is that we have visited every planet in the solar system except for Pluto, so we found a cheap way to take care of that. <laughs> so let's dive right into the set of myths. So the first myth that everybody asks us about or everybody is concerned about is cloud computing is not secure. That's the first you know, statement that we hear from basically anybody that we start talking to about cloud computing. And you know, Bruce Schneier uh, did a blog very recently where he started, you know, giving some very profound thoughts about cloud computing. And one of the things that he mentioned is the fundamental novelty of cloud computing is people are scared to trust a third-party entity. But having to trust a third-party entity is not a new concept. We already trust Microsoft and Red Hat with our operating systems. We already trust Cisco and Juniper with our firewalls. Cloud computing is introducing new entities that you have to learn to trust. You have to identify the risks and you have to sit with these vendors and see what you can do to mitigate these risks. And if you can mitigate these risks to a certain extent, then you can move on and actually take uh, the necessary precautions and move on and start taking advantage of the capabilities. So the APL story is actually along those lines. We started working with the cloud computing vendors very closely, and our IT security team works very closely with the IT security team of Amazon and Google and Microsoft. And, you know, in fact, our IT security team is on a first-name basis with uh, folks like CJ and Steve. And, you know, we are very working very closely with them to kind of share the government requirements that we have, the compliance issues that we have, and we have conveyed things like, well, you know, it would be really nice if you had a U.S. persons-only data center, which seemed very unlikely a few years ago, but now it has become a reality into what's called the GovCloud. And one of the things that we learned when we started talking to Amazon early on about uh, cloud computing was there's a separation of concern. And it's important to understand the separation of concern because it helps us focus on where our responsibilities are. And in the Amazon environment, at the, everything at the hypervisor layer and below is Amazon's responsibility. They have to ensure that the hypervisor is secure. They have to ensure that there isn't any cross-hypervisor attacks. That's their set of responsibilities. And they have to ensure that only packets routed for my virtual machines are given to me, and I'm not able to snoop on other people's data. But everything above the hypervisor, the operating system, the file system, the applications, that's my responsibility. And that is the organization's IT security team responsibility to ensure that the applications that we're deploying on these systems are actually secure. So we actually took that advice to heart. And in order to provide secure assets in the cloud computing environment, our IT security team has already started building uh, hardened AMIs. These are hardened Amazon machine images, which have every unnecessary service turned off. They have encrypted file systems. They have system logging turned on, and it logs back to JPL. They have host-based introduction detection systems. And we leverage the hypervisor-based uh, firewalls that Amazon provides us. And there's an interesting part in the stack, which is the JPL firewall. Now, how are we using the JPL firewall to protect the instances that are running in a cloud computing environment? And the answer to that is simple. It's the virtual private cloud uh, that, uh, that we started working with Amazon on a while back. We started, we came to Amazon and we said, well, here's a set of things that we want to do. And we conveyed these requirements, and very soon we had a product at our disposal, which was the virtual private cloud, and we dived into it as soon as it was uh, available to us. And what it's allowed us to do, and I think you guys all saw what the VPC does, so I'm not going to try to repeat um, what CJ did, but it allows us to leverage the investments we have made to protect our internal assets and enable us to use them to protect the assets in Amazon. 
So we're literally virtually extending our data center into Amazon's data center by using technologies like the VPC. Any data that goes that's exchanged between JPL and Amazon in the VPC is encrypted over this IPsec tunnel. It traverses over the IPsec tunnel. That means nobody on the internet can see the transactions that are happening between JPL and Amazon. With that said, I guess the main lesson that I'm trying to share here is that it's not the cloud that's inherently insecure, and it's not your local data center that's inherently more secure. It's what you do with it. And you really have to identify the set of capabilities that are available and the new operations paradigm and learn to live in those new operations paradigm. And as you learn to do that, you'll learn that in many ways, cloud computing can actually offer you a more secure solution. Because in a, with a single API call, you can get an inventory of all the machines that are running. With a single API call, you can get a list of all the ports that you have opened. And that's a very empowering thought for our IT security staff. And at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, we're actually also working very closely with the NASA Office of the Inspector General to work on incident response. That's a lot of our protocols to ensure that we can actually comply to the regulations that the government has imposed on us to ensure that we can comply to them if there is a breach. And we're working very closely with the vendors to do that. Now, the next trend is actually also very common, which is, you know, around mission criticality. So people talk about, well, cloud computing may or may not be the most reliable solution. And yeah, my Mac did not just blue screen, uh, if you're wondering. Uh, but the myth is that cloud computing is not reliable. And, you know, when you go to the people that are running rovers on Mars, people like myself, and you tell them that, you know, we're going to run your servers, your mission critical applications in the cloud, we start asking, well, wait a minute. You know, that machine that I can go hug over there is actually way more reliable than, you know, some machine that I can't see. But then you realize that a lot of those mission critical applications are actually running on a single machine. Right? So there's no way that a single machine in my local data center is going to be more reliable than multiple machines spanning multiple data centers. And then we actually also had a chance to do some introspection, which is, do we have real redundancy in our data centers? This is an actual picture. This is a station fire uh, from a couple of years ago. This is a fire, and the place that you see in the background there, or in the foreground, is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This is a natural disaster. This, uh, the station fire came within a one-mile radius of JPL. The entire JPL was evacuated. Our data centers were left without staff. And any outages that occurred during that time could not be addressed. And we started asking ourselves, so we have got geographical redundancy for our data. And we've got geographical redundancy for some of our applications, but not all of them. And why is that? It's because it's hard. It's expensive, right? So what can we do to augment the availability of our applications? So it's the cloud. You know, there's two ways to look at the availability metrics in the cloud. One of them is to look at, well, maybe it makes your application less available or more available if you deploy it completely in the cloud. And the other way to look at it is how can you actually augment the availability of your application by deploying that same application suite in the cloud so that it's ready to go when you need it in case you have a natural disaster like that. And the other thing that you get with the cloud environments is you get the ability to have uniform APIs to provision resources in the East Coast or the West Coast, and everything looks exactly the same. So you can get cross-coast redundancy without having to buy a single piece of hardware, without having to rent facility, and without having to rewrite software to be able to run differently in a completely different environment. And you can automate this entire process because all of this can be done via API calls. With that said, we actually decided that you can actually run mission-critical applications in a cloud computing environment, and we took that advice and, you know, we put our money behind our, our, our statement. And in November of 2010, the Mars Exploration Rovers uh, operated at uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory became the first NASA mission to operate a mission-critical application in a cloud environment, a public cloud environment. So what, what's happening here is we have uh, the plans for what the rover is going to do the next day. This is what the scientists are deciding what the rover is going to do the next day. They're stored on S3, and they're cataloged on uh, SimpleDB. And we're able to actually encrypt the data before it leaves JPL and only decrypt it outside of JPL. What this allows us to do is to store sensitive information in the cloud environment, but gain the availability and durability that we don't have access to otherwise. And actually, I should also report that since November of 2010, you've got 100% availability on that application. That application has not gone down since. And in fact, if it went down right now, I'd get a call, and I'd kind of have to step out. Um, 
and beg for my job. <laughs> um, so I gave a couple of positive uh, sounding myths about cloud computing. The next myth that we come to across very often is cloud computing is uh, offers infinite capacity, which means that anybody can come in and provision all the capacity that's available to you in the cloud environment and kind of take over the cloud, um, or that I can provision, you know, 5,000, 50,000, 500,000 machines. And, you know, I kind of want to address that myth by showing you a demo, and the purpose of the demo is twofold. Uh, the second one will become clear in a second, but the first one is to illustrate the simplicity with which you can uh, order applications and order um, infrastructure in the cloud environment. Now, how many of you have actually ordered infrastructure recently? You know, like, I want five machines or one machine. I just, you know, you start out by emailing your favorite, I say, system administrator, or favorite IT person, and then you exchange a bunch of emails, and then you wait for, you know, a vendor to come in and send you the device, and then it has to be installed physically quickly translates into months or weeks of labor. In a cloud environment, um, let me actually show you. In this particular case, so I've got zero in applications, uh, zero instances running right now, and in order to illustrate the simplicity with which you can provision instances in the cloud, rather than sending emails, I've got this thing right here. It's the Cloud Computing Control Box 2.0. <laughs> it's a knob. I, I work at JPL, so I, I kind of have to have this geeky infrastructure. But let me give you a closer look. Um, I guess the contrast isn't quite there yet. But <laughs> Cloud Control 2.0. So I showed you on the Amazon Management Console that I have zero instances running right now. And I kind of want to just push Amazon as much as I possibly can today and see how many instances I can provision just by, you know, uh, turning this knob a little bit. And just to give you an idea, instances will show up here once they've actually been provisioned. So, well, I provisioned two machines. I think I provisioned more than that, so let's just give it a second. All right, three machines. That's really not pushing Amazon art. Uh, let's see what else we can do. Let's turn this a lot um, and see what happens here. All right, 16. That's nearly not hardcore enough. I, I can do better than this. I'm just going to keep turning it until, you know, uh, either somebody comes on stage and jumps me or... <laughs> All right, we've got 20 machines. Uh, let's just keep going. 20 machines is nearly not hard enough. The one thing I'll note is usually I have a little faster internet connection, but this is all happening automated, by the way. This is not... Somebody isn't sitting in the back provisioning these machines for me, uh, just in case you're wondering. 58, I'm going to turn to some more. <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, in all fairness, I'm running micro instances right here, and these micro instances end up costing two cents an hour. So uh, what's going to happen here is I'm going to provision 300 instances, and that ends up costing me about $6. So I think I can tackle that uh, pretty easily. Now. The point that I was trying to make here is provisioning machines is completely different than what, it, what you're used to in the past. You know, it's literally as simple as this. And when I go to a mission manager and say, you know, you want your data faster today? Why don't you turn this knob a little bit and get your data fast, right? And researchers at Berkeley actually had a very profound thought. They said, if you've got a parallel application that's going to require 100 hours of computation, whether you run it on one machine for 100 hours or on 100 machines for one hour, it costs you exactly the same thing what you have gained is 99 hours of strategic advantage over your partners or your competitors, depending on how you choose to look at it. And one thing I will add is, you know, recently uh, David Knight, who's also in here in the audience, uh, ran a test on Amazon's, uh, he ran Linpack on it, just to see what we can do for, you know, if he had $15 uh, to spare. And he was able to actually accomplish two teraflops for about $16.20 per hour. And this was with 30 uh, HPC nodes. Now, 20 of those running parallel will get you on the top 500 supercomputing list. So that's the model that you have available to you. So for a small budget, uh, budgeted uh, project, you know, having that kind of capacity available to you is actually quite important. And moving forward, having this level of simplicity for provisioning is actually quite important. And our ITC, our ITCTO and our CIO has come out and given us 
the, this vision that they have outlined for us is to replace every procurement screen with a provisioning screen. There's no reason for a JPL analyst or a scientist to have to order a machine and then wait for two weeks. That just doesn't make sense. Anytime they order a machine, whether it's one machine, 50 machines, or 300 machines, they should be able to get access to them within minutes rather than months. And that's the vision with which we're, you know, that we're trying to pursue. And I'll end it on two notes. Since our main business is uh, robotics, we can actually focus on our, our new hobby and actually get into robotics. And I forgot to have sound here. So I'll just uh, annotate this quickly. I, I nearly can't uh, replicate the music as much. But this is athlete. This is the all-train hex-legged extraterrestrial explorer. It's 18 feet tall at half scale. It can crawl, walk, um, climb on things. And recently, we needed to take this out robot out to the uh, Arizona desert. And we needed to, our goal was to traverse 60 kilometers of very challenging terrain. And our scientists and our drover drivers needed to understand, uh, to have the situational awareness of the field. So we needed to process a lot of the high level uh, digital elevation maps to actually understand the terrain that they were going to traverse. And we were able to process a lot of that terrain, actually the entire terrain, by provisioning 32 node cluster with HPC nodes. And within 12 hours, we had the entire train mapped and ready to view in a 3D view. And that was actually very empowering because for a small budgeted project like this, we provisioned 32 machines, ran it for 12 hours, and shut it down. And we're done. We don't have to pay for it anymore. And this is my final slide. The, it's important to realize the powers of cloud computing. And within JPL, cloud computing has actually taken us by a storm already. Uh, the Mars Exploration Rover is already running production applications in the cloud. Mars Science Laboratory is using cloud computing for not only mission at critical applications, but as well as outreach to get the data out to the world about, you know, the, the latest Mars images that are coming down. We're using in the deep space network to calculate when we're going to have encounters and the ability to get line of sight with uh, deep space uh, robots. We're using it for Earth science. We're using it to store lunar, store process and deliver lunar imagery. And I like the last one a lot because it makes me feel like I live in a science fiction movie. We have astronomers looking for black holes in the galactic center using processing capabilities that are available to them in the cloud. It is very empowering for our scientists to actually get this level of computations at their disposal so quickly and so easily. And the best part of it all is that we're just getting started. Thank you.